Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin from Buffer. I'm really excited to be sharing with you today in our very first live Q&A. So it's going to be a wonderful chance for me to do a lot of talking and answer a lot of questions. Um, thank you so much for everyone who has submitted questions already. We had a number of great ones come in over email, and we've had some come in through Google+, and we're keeping our eyes on Twitter and, and Google+, and other social networks, too, throughout this live Q&A. So really excited to get going. Um, wanted to mention a couple quick things off the top. This is our very first live Q&A, so I really appreciate you giving us the chance to experiment with this and hopefully provide you something that's super valuable and useful. We love any feedback and tips that you might have for us throughout. Um, we're very keen to improve on this and to deliver something really great for you. Another thought we had, too, is that it'd be great to hear any questions if you have any that come to mind during the live Q&A. There's a couple of different places you can ask them. You can ask them on Twitter with the hashtag BufferLive or you can ask them here in the Google Hangout by using the Q&A tool. And I'd love to tell you quickly how to maybe open that if you don't quite see it. If you're watching from Google+, you might see a list of icons down the left-hand side. And there's, uh, there's one that says Q&A on it. And that would be the one that might open something on the right-hand side then of your screen where you can ask a question. You can kind of see the questions that I'm answering as I'm answering them. If for any reason that doesn't come up for you, there might be a menu bar in the top of your screen with four little squares. Looks like a little window. If you click on that, you can add the Q&A app to your Hangout, and then you should be good to go with loading it from there. Um, any questions on that, feel free to leave a comment on the, the Hangout or on Twitter, and we'll be very, very happy to jump right on that and assist. So really great to have you here today. Um, really excited to share with you all. And yeah, I'd love to, to kick it off with kind of the first questions. So the first one that, that I have here is one from Mike Petrucci. And he asked on Google+, what do you wish you knew before starting at Buffer? And I really love that question. I think it's, it's such a wonderful chance to reflect back on kind of my early days at Buffer, too. What I remember maybe most vividly is not having any previous startup experience and then jumping into the startup pace at Buffer was just a wonderful um, kind of view of, of what things can be like and how fast people can move on different things. And it's just been such a wonderful experience to kind of have that as, as part of my life and my journey now. I feel like before I joined, the startup pace for me was something that was maybe a bit more intuitive, where I just enjoyed creating things and making things on my own spare time and trying lots of things. And I'm grateful that that maybe part of my personality is something that ended up being quite startup-y. And now that's something that I get to practice every day at Buffer. So coming into the environment here, that was something I didn't really expect or, or know before starting. I definitely could have if I had done my research, I think. I think uh, startups are all really exciting in this way. So that's something that, uh, that, yeah, has just been a really great thing for me to kind of reflect on and to, to think back on how that's been. Thanks for that great question. The next question that I love to answer comes from Alex. And Alex sent this one in over email. Alex asks, if you could enlist the Buffer team for a week, how could we help you plan a social media marketing campaign strategy? And wow, Alex, that would be, <laughs> that would be incredible. Um, I have like a, a personal vision of traveling places and helping people get set up with different things like that. So thank you for letting me have the chance to kind of brainstorm on this one with you. I think with the opportunity to kind of plan a social media marketing campaign um, from scratch in a lot of ways. It's, it's a quite exciting thought because there's so many different things you could focus on and do. And one thing that I often come back to is like how I can best spend a certain amount of my time. So if I have 30 minutes, how can I best spend 30 minutes of my time? And there's a few different things that come to mind in terms of like a social media strategy maybe. I think first and foremost is, is understanding the goal of the social media campaign. So if you're looking for clicks, if you're looking for follows, if you're looking for engagement or sentiment, it kind of, I guess, changes the, the tone and the nature of the campaign itself, depending on what you're looking for. So a lot of times the campaigns that we run, we're quite interested in looking at, at the clicks, the click results. So we will create headlines and, and kind of come up with the content and plan around the goal of driving clicks. And 
that, that kind of changes the tone if you're, instead of going for a campaign of awareness or follows, then you're not really, I guess, putting the content in such a way that you're driving clicks, you're more just driving engagement and positive sentiment and things like that. So to start off with the goal setting, what you have in mind. I think the second part of a, of a cool campaign is kind of knowing how you're gonna track it afterward. So we are really grateful for the chance to have some cool tools within Buffer that we used to track. And if you happen to, to be a Buffer user or, or have the chance to hop into the analytics side on Buffer, there's a couple of cool places to look. Definitely in our Buffer for Business plans, we have lots of neat things. And then also in kind of the general analytics tab, there's um, sortable analytics. So we can see a sorted view of the posts that have done well in terms of clicks or reach or retweets or shares, comments, pretty much any type of engagement you can have on a social media bit of content. Um, we have it there inside Buffer. So definitely knowing what you want to look for and then kind of knowing what you want to track and having a way to track that. I think those are maybe two of the higher level kinds of views with a, a campaign. And then if I were to get down maybe into the more actionable day-to-day um, -day things, I think having a, a hashtag or something to organize around is great for campaigns. I think uh, being purposeful about where you target those campaigns. So if it's just Twitter, if it's just Facebook, if it's just a Facebook ad even, if it's um, just really segmented and, and focused on a certain segment that you have in mind for the campaign. And then having a good way to track it back to a landing page where the ask of the campaign is, is clear enough that there's only one thing that that person would need to do. So if it's click here to receive this, then the next page they go to, they receive this. If it's click here to follow, then it's an easy, an easy interaction where they can follow right away. So that's kind of the stuff that comes to mind in terms of helping, helping you out. It'd be fun to hang out together and work on a project like that together. Um, I think we'd have a lot of fun with that. So hopefully that, that helps with kind of some answers along those lines. Cool, the next question I have here is from Charlotte who sent this one in over email. Her question is, one of the challenges for marketers I think is predicting trends. What do you think the social media digital trends are likely to be over the next five years? And wow, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I'm in a good place to, to predict um, with very much accuracy what that might be. Um, I'm happy to toss about some, some random thoughts and ideas that come to mind on that one. I think personally, I'm quite excited about this idea of messaging apps. And what I mean by messaging apps is maybe something like Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or even to a certain degree Slack and HipChat, just kind of chat rooms that have, have grown in popularity. And I'm not sure exactly how it fits in terms of social media marketing, but I get the sense that a lot of conversations are moving in that direction. And I personally don't have any ideas yet on how to get marketing into there, but I, I think that that's something I'd love to kind of think on more. And, and in the coming years, that might be more and more important as, uh, as different networks pop up and different tools gain in popularity. One thing that comes to mind that I don't know if it'll ever come to come to pass or not, um, but is this is this concept of, I guess in WhatsApp, I've noticed that people have moved their newsletters to WhatsApp. So instead of sending an email newsletter, they're sending a WhatsApp message with a link that links then to the newsletter itself. So it's more of an, an SMS or a text message kind of notification. I've seen different people use some cool tactics on Slack where they're building out ways to share links and share content from within Slack. And I'm not quite sure how you as a content creator are able to contribute to that, but just the fact that those conversations are happening is, is quite exciting for me. Something else that comes to mind in terms of trends is definitely video content. And in particular, I think the idea of live casting is something that's gonna gain even more and more in popularity. Um, I, I might be behind the trend a bit in mentioning that since since stuff like Periscope and Meerkat have been so great. And, uh, and I think networks will continue to kind of move in that direction where people are able to share this kind of very intimate way of connecting with someone. This live Q&A that we're doing is an experiment um, for a lot of reasons because of that connection. And I think being able to show a face to some advice and some words is a really powerful way of, of connecting on a deeper level. So those are a couple that come to mind, uh, messaging apps and video live casting. So, It'll be fun to kind of follow along and, and see if any of that comes to fruition. Great, the next question that I have here is from Ellen, who sent this one in over email. Ellen says, 
I'd be interested in your thoughts on measuring social media ROI. What are some important metrics to track? And that's a great, big, huge question. <laughs> I think uh, I think social media ROI is is one that I personally would definitely I definitely could improve on my tracking of it. Um, I'm not too disciplined in tracking that myself. And I think what it comes down to for me is this idea that ROI is a lot about dollars and cents. And I'm not sure I have a very good grasp on the dollars and cents side from from my side. Um, the time I spend on social media doesn't feel like it costs me anything. And yet, I guess it does cost me salary, and it might cost in terms of certain tools that I use. And I guess being a bit more disciplined on that side of things would be a great first step in order to track ROI. So understanding the dollars and cents amounts that you're able to kind of add to, to your social media marketing. So once you can figure out how much you put in, then you kind of figure out how much you get back. And that's the other another good one to think on. Um, with that one, it's it's a lot about understanding your conversions and your conversion rate and your funnel and how all that works. So if you were to send a, a tweet that links back to your, your app or your tool and someone signs up through that, then how much of that value of that person's eventual subscription can be tied back to Twitter? And a few extra factors that come into play there are if the person signs up to a free app, then there's no dollar and cent value to assign at that stage. But if they upgrade later on, then yes, you can add that back in. And then you can kind of think about lifetime value of someone who joins you. If if someone who, who signs up for your app or service ends up spending $200 on average over a number of years, and that's kind of your average lifetime value, then you can bring that number back and, and stick it into your formula. So I guess in terms of, of ROI and measuring it from social media, it's a bit tricky for me personally to figure all that out because there's lots of different dollars and cents values. What we often do at Buffer is kind of aim for not so much as a direct social media ROI, but more of a, I guess, more of an engagement type of metric where we're noticing kind of the time and effort that we put in and then kind of looking for referral traffic back to our site from social, um, we're looking for direct clicks on different updates. And just noticing these different elements of things is, is kind of been quite key for us. In terms of the specific metrics, like I kind of said before, clicks are great. Um, conversion path and lifetime value, and then the dollar amount with the resources that you put in, all of those uh, make for a great kind of combination on sorting through the, the ROI formula. This is great. I see some questions coming in as, as we're talking too, so thank you all for, for dropping some questions in. This is really cool. OK, this one is from Yodi Collins. Hi, Yodi. It says, I don't use Buffer, but spend a good deal of my daytime hours mining the internet for useful information to share. That's awesome. I, I'm right there with you. How could Buffer help me in this endeavor? Wow, that's a great one. And really grateful for the chance to share some, some of my thoughts on this with you, Yodi. Um, so I, I also spend a lot of daytime hours <laughs> mining the internet, so to speak, for, for stuff to share. And where Buffer comes in really great for me is is it lets me focus so much of my, my mental energy in the searching and the finding for, of content. And then Buffer makes it super easy to kind of at the back end come in and, and make it a, a smooth way to share that content with others. So for me personally, what that workflow would look like is I subscribe to lots of newsletters. I have lots of feeds in my Feedly. And all of that content that looks interesting to me, I will add directly into my pocket, which is a kind of read it, read it later app and from within Pocket, then I'm able to go in when I have 30 minutes or an hour in the day and do all of my reading at once. And as I read through things, the stuff that I find, I might kind of notice that, oh, this would be cool to share, or I'd love to, to be able to pass this along. And then all I do is click the star button on that article. And then I have an ift recipe, which is a way to automate a couple different services to, to kind of connect with each other. So every time I mark something as a favorite inside of Pocket, that article then goes into my buffer automatically. And if knows to grab a picture even from the article and, and stick that along with the social update. So it really makes life quite easy for me. All I, all I then need to do is go into buffer later on. And then I'll kind of make sure the updates look the way I want them to, add any commentary or text. The, the if recipe pulls in the headline in addition to the, the photo. So a lot of my work is already done, which is, which is very much appreciated. So that's like the one, the one big benefit that I found in including Buffer in kind of my curation. 
Um, the second benefit is that I don't need to be online when I share anything. I can find 30 articles today and share those 30 articles spaced out at optimal times over the next 10 days and just kind of batch myself and, and almost replicate myself to a certain degree where I can be sharing when I'm not online. So kind of those two put together are really um, the greatest benefits I have received in terms of curation with Buffer. So I, I'm not sure how far along you are in exploring with those, but I'd love to hear if, uh, if either of those things resonate at all with, with your experience. Great, this one is from, this next one is from Sarah Eggers. Hi, Sarah. Sarah asks, I saw that Buffer is looking for new people to join the happiness team. What are some of the fun, amazing things about working at Buffer? Um, wow, uh, where, where to begin? I, I guess I'll start by saying Buffer has just been a, an amazing, fantastic experience for me to, to have joined. And it's not only in the perks and the, the kind of cool, cool things that we get to have and do, it's also in the ability to be working alongside people whom I greatly admire and respect and trust and appreciate and to have all of those values kind of reflected back to me where um, I feel very valued and, and trusted and, and respected and um, just a very much of a kindred spirit atmosphere here. So I don't know if that qualifies as a fun and amazing thing about working at Buffer, but I've, I've definitely felt that quite acutely in my time here. Um, in terms of the actual things that we, we do get with perks and different things like that, um, everyone on the team who joins receives a Kindle and a Jawbone Up. And the Kindle, we can ask for any books that we'd like to read, and, and those are gifted to us. Um, it really fits in with well with our value of constantly learning and self-improvement. So we're very much encouraged to, to practice that through the Kindle. And then with the Jawbone Up, it's a fitness tracking tool, so we're able to receive that and then track our steps and our sleep and our activity. And we're encouraged to connect with the team so that all of us on the team can see those different um, stats and, and engage with each other and hold each other accountable in that way. We also get a chance to be together a couple times each year within a retreat to somewhere fun and exciting around the world. We just recently visited Iceland together. And in the past, I've had the chance to to attend retreats in Sydney and New York. And there's also been some in South Africa and San Francisco and Thailand. I think I might, I think that might be all the ones that I, I can remember. Um, those are great opportunities to connect with, with people too. Um, in terms of benefits also, I think remote work at Buffer is a huge benefit for me where we can choose the place that we are happiest and most productive to work. So in my case, this is, it's at home <laughs> here, here in the house in, in an office. Um, for others on the team, it's, is taken the form of being quite nomadic and traveling all over and not really having a home base. Um, others enjoy going to a co-working space in town and spending some time working with, with other folks in the same building. So that flexibility is, is definitely a fun, amazing thing about Buffer. So that, that just kind of probably scratches the surface of what I've particularly enjoyed here, um, but definitely some of the highlights for me. And yeah, if anyone's interested in, in kind of exploring Buffer further, we have a lot of listings up at buffer.com slash journey and we'd definitely love to hear from you there if, if anything if any position grabs you this is great i see lots more coming in so i'm gonna grab some of the, the newest ones okay this one is from beatrice and beatrice says i use buffer for work but I'm uncertain on how to really use it for my personal social media. And that's, that's a great point. How do Buffer employees use Buffer as a tool for their personal social media? And what are some suggestions and thoughts I might have on that? Thank you, Beatrice. That's, that's a really great question. I think, uh, I think there's, I definitely take lots of inspiration from the folks on the team who share. I'm happy to share my personal workflow and what I've observed from others. I, have the chance to kind of share through Buffer. So I definitely understand that element of using Buffer for work, so to speak. Um, and then the flip side for me is, is sharing through my personal um, Twitter handle at Kevin Lee. And I have, I have made it a point to kind of focus my sharing from that side and, uh, and share as much as I can about a specific topic. So I'm interested in a lot of different things that might not be, might not appear in my Twitter timeline. 
and that's a very purposeful choice on my on my hand. Um, I I love football. I love soccer. I love dogs. I love certain TV shows. I love certain movies. Certain books. Um, I love writing, and that writing one is the one that I had kind of chosen to be my go to for for sharing on Twitter. So that helped a lot in kind of making that decision where it's not just share everything, but it shares something in particular. And once I made that decision, then it was quite easy, quite a bit easier for me to focus the content that I filled up, up my buffer with. So I'm still able to engage real time with the things that do interest me in terms of if there's a movie or a game that's happening, then that's um, that's kind of a cool, a cool thing to just engage with automatically on Twitter in, in real time. Um, but in terms of filling my buffer, I have a three times a day schedule. And this is for Twitter, three times a day to Twitter. And I'll fill that up. I think currently it has maybe 100 different updates in there just because I've come across some really cool things lately that I'm excited to share. And then I focus that kind of around the articles that I enjoy reading, and in particular, any writing or content marketing things that have been um, particularly meaningful to me and I thought worth sharing. So I fill up my buffer using a tool called Bulk Buffer. And using Bulk Buffer, you can use a, you can grab a spreadsheet of tweets. So let me think of the best way to explain this. <laughs> Maybe if I took a step back and said, it's possible that you can have an if recipe that takes all of your tweets, adds them to a spreadsheet as you tweet them. And then what you can do is take that spreadsheet, change the tweets or edit the tweets and add them back into your buffer. So you kind of have this ongoing evergreen cycle of content that, that uh, is great to share. We, one of our recommendations at Buffer is to share content multiple times. Um, the recommendation behind that is because you can reach people who didn't see it the first time. We personally reach maybe 5 to 10% of people on our social media updates. So that leaves 95, 90% that, uh, that would have never seen certain content from us. So that's one benefit. Another benefit is hitting people in different time zones. And then the third benefit is reaching people who have joined and followed you since you last shared the content. So I'm probably getting a bit far away from your specific question, but this is kind of how, how I personally view that all of that. With that in mind, I then add stuff back into my queue and edit it and, and change it around slightly and add pictures and, and make it feel a bit different and unique. And yeah, and that's that makes it really easy. So I'm able to add, you know, 150 tweets in five minutes and I'm good to go for a month, just having knowing I have content there. And as I find new things, Buffer gives the option to either add to your queue to share it now immediately or to um, add it next. So if you add to the queue, it goes to the bottom of the queue. If you share it now, it goes out right now. And if you sh uh, add it next, then it'll go to the top of the queue. So if I find something that's timely or something that I think would be, uh, would be useful to kind of share more urgently, I'll add it to the top of the queue. So when I publish new blog posts or when I read something that's, that's great, it goes to the top and I still have a buffer full of stuff for the rest of the time. So that's kind of how I personally use it. I've seen others who, who do a great job of kind of mixing the different types of content that they share. So our founder, Joel, has this system. He calls it the, or maybe we call it. I don't know if he um, has a name for it. But I, well, I've, I've personally called it the four to one system, where you identify kind of, I think it's five different types of content you can share on social media, a photo, a quote, a link, a status update, and a reshare or a retweet. And out of those five, you would then choose one as kind of your staple update. So in my case, the staple update for me is a link share. And then the other, the other four kind of re represent the one size of so the four to one sharing ratio. Every five updates that you post, four of them will be your staple update. And then the one will be kind of something that's a bit different. So, um, it's great to kind of do that within Buffer because you can see the types of updates that you're sending based on kind of an icon that is to the left of the update. So I can glance at it and see, OK, I have three links coming up and then a, a quote. So I'm good to go. Or I can see, oh, I have 10 links right up against each other. So I can kind of drag quotes and, and retweets and things within that queue. And yeah, it just makes it kind of easy to, to kind of organize yourself around all that. So. Hoping that might give you some ideas about some possible things to try. Um, definitely keen to help out more if we can too. This is great. Um, I'm going to grab. This question came from, from Joe. And he asked if I could share 
the ift recipes that I mentioned and be very happy to. I might, <laughs> like I mentioned, the live Q&A is very much an experiment for us. So I'm going to experiment with sharing my screen here and see if you all can see this. This is my buffer. I'll do my best to kind of navigate over to ift to show you what these recipes might look like. If you happen to go to ift.com, you can do a you can do a couple different things. You can go over to channels, which is in the top right corner. And within channels, there's a search box. You can search for a buffer. Bring up buffer below. And when you click on buffer, it gives you the chance to connect the channel if you haven't yet. Um, and what's really cool is if you look below that, there's a section for popular buffer recipes. And these are ones that have been really useful for us. Um, we had a chance to kind of partner with the IFT team to recommend some that, that we've noticed had been quite, quite helpful. So just briefly kind of looking at the list here, um, some of the ones that I mentioned are going from pocket into buffer. And that one is here on kind of the, the buffer recipe page. And that's a great one for just kind of curation and, and quickly sharing the stuff that you find that's great. You can also go from Feedly straight to Buffer. So if you read a lot from within your Feedly or your RSS reader, you can go right from that article within Feedly to add straight to your Buffer. There's an IFT recipe that, that makes a, an editorial calendar based on your, on your buffered updates, which is just amazing functionality. I, I'm blown away by whoever thought up that one. Um, it, it recognizes kind of the times that you send things, the times you have things scheduled, and it adds those into a Google Calendar that you can then use as kind of an editorial view, editorial calendar view of your social media. And yeah, then the other one I just mentioned a second ago is share from Buffer or share to Twitter and then add to a spreadsheet. Um, you can wire that one up in a lot of different ways. Buffer is a great one to do it with. Um, you can use the specific network, so Twitter or Facebook, et cetera. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a cool way. A lot of people use it to build an archive. And I've noticed that's quite helpful for a lot of folks. So yeah, any, any that are on this page, again, that page is ift.com slash buffer. And it, ift is I-F-T-T-T. -T -T, it stands for if this, then that. And yeah, lots of cool stuff, um, not only with buffer, but with most any other um, social media tool or online thing, even some offline things like colored light bulbs and different stuff like that. Um, lots and lots of cool uses for ift and wiring services together. So thank you for for asking for, for a bit more on that one, Joe. Great. I'm going to do this one next from Miro. And Miro asks, with all the recent changes in Facebook's algorithm and how organic reach has changed, do you foresee other social networks adopting similar pay-to-play strategies? And uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a wonderful question and one to think about. Um, I have noticed a lot of, I guess there's a couple of things that come to mind with that. Um, one thing that I've noticed with Facebook is, is their newsfeed is just an amazingly powerful and useful tool that has helped for certain, for certain has helped me kind of appreciate being on Facebook and having all this stuff that is very relevant and useful to me automatically appear without my having to go look for it. So I think this algorithm-based approach to a feed or a timeline is, is kind of central to the notion of pay to play versus something that's like Twitter, where it's just a, a steady stream of everything from everyone you follow. And it's not necessarily, um, it's not algorithm-based by any means. It's kind of whatever someone has posted most recently goes to the top, and you can kind of look at all of it. Um, with those two different mindsets there, it feels like a lot of networks are moving more toward the Facebook algorithm approach. I know Pinterest has, has an algorithm on their homepage and, and things, and, uh, and some others do. And I think once you move into that algorithm approach, I think my, my sense is that's kind of when the pay to play comes in, where all of your content isn't automatically served to people. It's served based on an algorithm and based on previous engagement and based on a number of factors that you don't necessarily control. And my sense is that businesses would appreciate having an extra layer of control over things, which is kind of where the, the paid advertising comes in. 
So if I were to make a, a good guess, I would say that yes, pay to play is probably something that will will be ha happening a lot more so and, and maybe be a, a bit more pronounced on other networks um, coming up. I think anything that Facebook does is, is probably magnified a hundredfold just because of their user base and size. And that is kind of a trickle down effect then to the, the smaller networks, which themselves are huge and enormous, um, but in relation to Facebook, maybe not quite as large. So the effect, while it might be happening currently, I know, for instance, Pinterest has some ads that they're kind of experimenting with and growing. Um, the, the larger effect of kind of, oh, this feels a lot like Facebook's pay to play at this point um, might be a bit more subtle and take a bit more time to get there. But I, I have the sense that it might be kind of moving in that direction. And if I can maybe piggyback on your question with another thought is, uh, is this, this whole idea of should you be paying for uh, getting your posts out there or is it okay to, um, to, to kind of go for the organic reach side of things? And that's something that we're quite interested in knowing ourselves. I think there's been a blog post that's been sitting in, in the idea list for a while about um, a 30 day organic reach experiment and just seeing if we can throw everything we can at getting improving our organic reach um, for free without paying anything, then we'd love to explore that and see what we can do. And my hunch is that it's, it's definitely possible because we've seen pages that do it. And we've noticed that there are folks who, who can get organic reach in huge, huge numbers. And what it comes down to then is kind of maybe reverse engineering those pages that do that well and finding out what is it about those strategies and updates that um, is resonating with people. And yeah, and then kind of taking that and, and applying it to yourself. My hunch is that a lot of it is about fitting into the Facebook newsfeed in such a way that an update from your business or brand seems quite natural alongside an update from your brother or your dad or your mom or your friends. And I, if I were to guess, I would say that uh, there's, there's a bit of a, a disconnect there for certain folks and certain brands at this point, which is kind of where um, lower engagement has come in and then paid advertising has, has come up. So that's something I'm, I'm excited to kind of explore more and see what we can figure out. And as always, we'll love to kind of report back what we find. So thank you for kicking off that cool discussion, Mira. That was a great one. Great, I'd love to ask this one from Twitter. This is from at Chris D008 from Twitter. And he, the question is, about how much time do you spend on preparing slash writing your blog posts? Uh, I love your content. Thank you, Chris, for saying that. That's, that's uh, amazingly kind. I, I'm very grateful for the chance to write for the blog and to, and to do things there. Um, yeah, and in terms of how much time we spend preparing and writing, it has completely been an evolution for me and continues to be one that um, I, I change a lot on. I think when I first joined Buffer, I came from a background that I was excited to produce content at the level that Buffer did. And I, I think I had a bit of an onboarding experience to kind of get up to speed and, and be able to do that as quickly as I would have liked to. And early on, it probably took, oh, eight to 10 hours to make a Buffer blog post the way that I was, was happy with. Um, and currently, it takes maybe three or four hours to put a post together. Um, we had a post that went live on the blog just today about social media checklists that I put together. And um, it was about 3,000 words and had lots of, lots of good visuals and things that we kind of aim for with our content. And if I'm kind of thinking back to the time that one took, it probably took about, about three or four hours to put together. And I could definitely have seen that one before taking <laughs> about twice as long or longer. And I think what's changed over time, and if I could share anything encouraging as far as kind of my development toward a faster writing process and style is um, I've definitely become more comfortable and faster at researching and knowing where to look for things. So a lot of the content in today's post, which kind of talks about different social media checklist items throughout your day, I was able to quickly reference things that were, were just in my mind from before, um, from being on the blog and knowing lots of stuff of previous content that we had published. Um, doing a lot of research for other things in the past. It's not necessarily I went out and started researching for checklists today. It's more that um, I have been immersed in social media for the last year, and all of these things are now coming to mind as I kind of experience them and, and think about them. So 
um, that difference, though it's probably quite subtle, um, makes a big impact on my time spent kind of ramping up and gearing up for writing something like that. So that was hugely useful for me um, and has been useful these past few months. And then I think too, I've, I've, uh, I've gotten more disciplined about my writing process. And that's something that I, I continually am, am still trying to improve and, and, and grow on. Um, last night when I was writing, I, I was writing it into the evening and I stopped at 930, which was great because I recognized, wow, I don't know that I would be making any sense if I were to keep going. And I think that was something I wouldn't have noticed in myself before. I would have just pushed through until it was done or until um, I fell asleep. I don't really know what, how long I would have lasted, but um, it's, it, I guess it's the idea of being mindful and, and conscious of kind of my energy and when I'm able to produce my best work has been a great hack for me in terms of um, how much time I spend on things. So yeah, if I could pass along any advice, I think it's it's been great for me to kind of be aware of that and to schedule my day in a way that I have the time to work on things when I have the energy to work on things. And once I'm in a task to be fully in that task and not um, pulling out to do other things or to check social media or to get kind of involved in something else, but to re be really mindful and focused and disciplined. Uh, from that side. So that might have been more than you asked for with that question. Um, so thank you for letting me share a bit extra there. But yeah, thank you for for kind of bringing that one up. That's a great one. All right, I'm just going to look through the list here to see what else has come in. Great, this one is from Ben. And Ben asks, Buffer does an amazing job with super informative blog posts that thoroughly cover the topics that we discuss, um, and we don't do much short form content. Is there a reason for this at Buffer? And uh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, I'd love to. I'd love to have a, a maybe a, a bigger conversation about that too sometime. But I, I think, for me personally, what we found on the blog is, <laughs> excuse me, is that the long form content has done really well for us when we tend to pull our numbers and our metrics, it seems to be that even the 2,500 word posts and up are the ones that are their highest performing. We typically aim for maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, between, um, I guess, around 2,000 words. 2,500 would be kind of a, a big, a great big one for us. Um, but those are the ones that tend to perform best and have historically. So I think that's kind of guided our process along those lines. What we're kind of excited to experiment with and don't have any idea how it will work, but are, are kind of keen to, to figure out is maybe using something like Medium as a way to do more short form content. And what I'd have in mind for short form would be, um, if anyone's familiar with a site like Daring Fireball or Kotkey.org, those two sites are kind of like a, well, maybe like a, a news aggregator of sorts where they'll pull out the most interesting news items on their, on their industry and niche. And from that point, kind of common, add commentary to them or just surface them for folks and kind of be this source of go-to information. And my sense is that maybe that could be quite powerful in terms of social media and, and worth trying for us. So I guess to answer the question, I have some ideas about short form content. Um, we have only validated long form content, which is why we are, I guess, so fully focused on that at this stage, but i um, excited to see what might come from the short form side as well. So thanks for uh, encouraging that, that thought and the nudge in that direction. Great, let me grab another one here. This is a great one. This one comes from Miguel. And Miguel asks, if I had to choose only three feeds to have on Feedly, which ones would they be? Oh boy. Um, I love Feedly. Maybe I can share my Feedly with you while we're chatting here. Um, yeah, I think, uh, here's my Feedly. I'm going to totally cheat and just probably read some of these off um, to you if I can log into the right one. It's funny, I have three or four Feedly's also. So um, <laughs> I totally cheat in terms of having um, in terms of having way more RSS link RSS stuff than I need. But um, yeah, if I were to choose maybe three or four, let's see what I have in the list here. For marketing blogs, what I really enjoyed is a site called Copy Hackers. And let me see if it's in the list here. 
not quite seeing it. Fast. I'll pull up the link. Um, copy Hackers is a site run by Joanna Weeb, and it's just amazing stuff about copy and how to write, and um, very, very detailed and action oriented, which is something I personally feel I can I can improve a lot on, and I'm excited to kind of learn from everything new that comes from their site. So. Uh, yeah, this is their site and, and just a really cool place to learn about writing. And I'm probably one of many who would list Copyblogger as a go-to place for um, different articles and things. This is their main site here that I'm just kind of scrolling through. Um, their blog has a lot of a lot of great information, and they've kind of gone in a direction for a lot of podcasts lately too, which has been fun to to learn and grow along with and. Yeah, I think a lot of my favorite articles over time are from Copy Blogger and a lot of the writers there. So I'm definitely keen to keep keep learning and, and, and stuff from them. And then Moz is another one that I, I quite enjoy. And here's their blog up here. Just some amazing thought leadership. Um, Moz itself is a lot about SEO, but their blog covers not only SEO, but also content and social media and covers it in a way that it it really inspires me to think bigger and think deeper on a lot of levels. So they're one that I, I constantly look to for advice and, and guidance um, from that side. And yeah, and then in terms of maybe non, <laughs> non, non, non marketing blogs, um, I do quite enjoy a certain site that has um, just ma magazine covers. I'm probably giving you way more than you asked for with this one, Miguel, but um, I love looking at magazine covers. So I think it's, um, i trying to think of the name. I think it's Cover Junkie that I find the magazine covers on. And then I love sports, so I go to SB Nation a lot for sports news. Um, they kind of have a, a lighthearted tone to a lot of the stuff they cover there. And then I love looking at pictures of, of funny dogs. So I am on Tumblr, and I kind of look at funny dog pictures when I need um, a big smile or, or something cool to look at. So yeah, those would be my three that I would choose that are not marketing related. So thank you for the chance to share all that. That's a great question. Cool. This is great that all these have come in. I'm, I'm going to do my best to get to as many as I can. And any that I don't get to, I will for sure um, leave answers to later on today so I, I can make sure we got get everyone covered here. Um, and thank you for voting them up, too. If, if there's a question that you see on the side that you'd love for me to answer before um, we get done here. Um, clicking the plus one or, or upvoting it would be really, really helpful. So I can make sure to, to get to the ones you're keen to, to hear. Uh, this one comes from Paul. And Paul asks, in a clickbait world, how do you remain, how do you remain intriguing yet honest in your headlines? <laughs> um, that's a great one. I, I, I definitely understand kind of where you're coming from with that. And I've noticed a couple of different things lately in terms of headlines where it's almost like a a complete reversal of clickbait, where it tells you everything in the headline, and you're still intrigued enough to click on it. Um, I don't know if that <laughs> I can't quite think of like any examples or how if we've done that with Buffer before, but I think this idea of creating content that in and of itself is so unique and engaging and intriguing that you can kind of give it all away in the headline and still have people who want to read that. Um, I think that's probably a really powerful way to, to stay honest in a headline and, and still get lots of good traction and clicks. And if I were to try that approach, I imagine a lot of emphasis would, would be placed on kind of the idea stage where you're thinking, wow, this is a great idea that we know um, will work great and we're keen to kind of throw it out there. I'm just thinking now that I'm kind of saying this, one thing that we tried recently on the blog is we stopped publishing new content for 30 days. And that as an idea seemed like something that might excite a lot of people or, or could be great to learn from. And in terms of framing that headline, then we could have gone with something like, um, we didn't publish new content for 30 days and only lost 4% of our traffic. Here's how or here's why. I'm not sure which way to say that. <laughs> um, but something along those lines might be kind of, kind of the opposite of clickbait and yet still intriguing. I think a few other things that come to mind in terms of um, intriguing and remaining honest are the specific words that you use in a headline. There's lots that can be quite engaging and quite interesting, and you can use them in context of kind of telling the honest story of what's to come in the blog post. I have a lot of, a lot of fondness for uh, headlines with numbers in them, and 
it's not so much like just a listicle. I think it's anything with a number kind of adds this specificity to a headline. So you can have something with a number and then also say, say for instance, I guess the headline I just used. So we stopped publishing blog posts for 30 days. This is what happened. Even the number 30 in there, it, it hints at something very specific in the headline where you're like, oh, wow. So they, they had this very, very particular idea and notion in mind and they acted on it. I bet I will learn a lot of specific actionable things from within the, the article itself. Um, if you see people use headlines like our traffic grew 300% with this one tip or, or something like that where it's an actual number, I think that's quite powerful then to get people to click through because they will expect to see some really cool stuff once they get into it. Um, in terms of specific numbers, I think one thing we found to be somewhat true for us is that odd numbers tend to work pretty well. And even further is prime numbers tend to work quite great also. And I, I want to say that the odd numbers has been slightly validated by research and the prime numbers is probably just like a wild intuition guess on my part. <laughs> but um, I'm not sure, maybe there's, I tried to research it even a while back and I think prime numbers have, um, my, my hunch is that prime numbers have some sort of psychological impact on folks where the numbers are so unique because they're prime that they kind of trigger something in the brain. And that is a wildly irresponsible thing for me to say without having any research behind it. But um, just a theory that I'm working with currently and we've seen some good results from that. If you look at headlines like um, 17 sources of, of amazing content or 39 ways to do, 39 a prime number? I don't think 39 is a prime number. 37 ways <laughs> to do Twitter and chats. Like those numbers kind of grab you and they've worked for us. So um, kind of got a bit deep onto the number side, but that would be something I might try um, in terms of headlines to get out of the clickbait and into the more honest and actionable side of things. Um, I guess my last thought on headlines is kind of this idea of delivering on the promise that you have in your headline. This is maybe a higher level view of headlines where if, you, uh, if you're if you writing a headline and you have kind of a vision for what the content will be behind that, that each of those match up so that when someone clicks on a headline, they're getting what they expect in the, in the article. And then over time, the idea is that that will kind of foster this expectation with the audience and the community that oh, I can click on most anything from the Buffer blog or from the Moz blog and know that they're going to make good on the promise of the headline, so to speak. So not that we would ever experiment with the clickbait headline, but if there was ever a headline that you were like, eh, I don't know if I really, I don't know what I'm going to get there. Like, you'll know what you're going to get there based on past history. So yeah, just kind of uh, a few extra headline tidbits that have been useful for us in the past. Um, but that's, that's a great one to think on too. Okay, I, uh, I love this question from Jessica. Jessica asks, what buffer feature that you think most users overlook or underutilize? Wow, I have a, I have a couple of them. Maybe I could share my screen again and see if I can um, show any of these to you. Let's see, let me open a new one so that it's fresh. OK, great. This is my, my buffer dashboard. And a couple of things that I, I really enjoy from here are um, the ability to drag and drop updates from within the queue. So I'll kind of I'll hit on a couple different levels of things. So um, dragging and dropping. So this is kind of the next, this is today and tomorrow on my queue. So this post here, if I wanted it to go first thing tomorrow, I would just mouse over the icon to the left of the update. And it changes from a pointer to a hand, and I can click and hold and then drag it around to different places. You can also click and drag from one profile to another profile. So if I wanted to share the same thing on Facebook, I could click and drag up to Facebook and it copies to my Facebook. There it is in Facebook. So clicking and dragging is a super big favorite of mine. <laughs> um, a very small one, which I, I think some folks know, and, and some folks might not, is you can set the different um, default profiles here on the left. So you'll see this as a check mark next to your default profiles. If you were to click that or unclick that, it then changes, it toggles it off or on. So I could set multiple ones as defaults. And then where that comes into play, let's say I'm on a particular website and kind of looking through things here, and I want to share this. 
So if I were to open the, the buffer extension, Buffer will recognize the profiles that I have selected as default and have them automatically selected for me from the start. So that's a very handy, handy way of doing things here. And then one more thing with the extension, a couple of things maybe. <laughs> There's so many, so many buffer features that I, I quite enjoy and would love to make sure everyone knows about. Um, if you right-click on any photo, you can go to buffer this image. And the image is, gets added to the update. And then likewise, if you were to, I'm just looking for something to highlight here. If you were to highlight anything, really, if there's a quote or a heading that really grabs you, you can right click and buffer. You can buffer selected text. And then the text automatically fills in there. And something new we're working on is you can buffer the text and create an image with Pablo. So this is kind of a, an up, upcoming version of Pablo, but um, it's our image creation tool. So we have that that's soon to be built into the extension as well. So yeah, those are a couple of my favorite ones. Um, I'd love to hear any of your alls too, if, if uh, there's one that catches your eye that I didn't quite touch on. Cool, I see we got about 10 minutes left, so I might breeze through a couple of these pretty quickly. Uh, this one, comes from Twitter again. I'll touch on this one fast. This is one we get a lot. This is from Chris D 8 and he asks, any plans to incorporate Instagram integration um, or if it's even possible? And that's a great one. I think having seen Hootsuite come out with Instagram recently has kind of brought this up, up again a lot for us. When we did customer development a while back to kind of learn from you all what you would like from us in terms of Instagram, the reaction and the feedback that we got was that you'd love for it to be as smooth and seamless as possible so that you're scheduling within Buffer and you don't have to worry about doing anything else that you know it's going to go straight to Instagram. And currently, the, what the Instagram API allows is for, is not that. <laughs> uh, what they allow for is, um, is the chance to kind of send notifications and to kind of work within the loose structure of, of kind of the publishing side, but not fully engaged there, which is kind of, um, what we're excited about and, and hopeful for, and um, just kind of try, doing our best to stay in communication with Instagram from that side. And so a solution like like the Hootsuite has come up with and some others have been really kind of smart to come up with is this idea of scheduling it, and then you receive a notification on your phone to then you personally go in and push the update to Instagram. So there's still a bit of, of manual process involved there. And I think we're kind of we're quite excited to kind of be at a stage where we can maybe offer a solution that doesn't include the manual side of things. We'd love to fully automate it for you all. Um, and we're definitely open to hearing hearing more from you if that's what you have in mind for Instagram integration or if you have something different in mind or what would be most helpful. Um, I think we're we're making some assumptions there as 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 few as we can, but but still we'd love to kind of hear your thoughts and your interest and feedback on what would be most helpful for you. Great. Um, here's a good one. They're all good ones. <laughs> this is one that had, had a few votes to it, so I'll be make sure to grab this one. Uh, this one is from Dominic. The question is, is Buffer working on any other tools to increase social media marketing, or is the app the only focus at the moment? Um, let me first say what I love about Buffer. Many things I love about Buffer. One of them is transparency, so it feels great to be able to share um, pretty much anything that comes to mind for me right now. <laughs> and uh, I think. I think a few things that we're, we're excited about, um, I guess if I were to maybe think about it a bit deeper too, we're, we have this idea of we're open to kind of moving in whatever direction the company um, feels like it might take. So if it's social media marketing, if it's social media um, monitoring, if it's engagement, if it's reports, if it's this or that, I think we're very open to exploring those directions and kind of seeing how they go. So really everything is on the table, so to speak. Um, what we're personally kind of excited to, to move on now is the things that we have validated as potential areas that could be most helpful for you all. So we have uh, an optimal timing tool that we've been kind of thinking on and exploring a bit where we'll be able to kind of look at your timelines and determine what times might be the best to post or the best to experiment with and then suggest those to you. 
um, we're currently doing some some work on on kind of uh, thinking bigger about reporting and monitoring and if there's ways that we can assist you all with that. And yeah, then I think uh, I think big picture we're we're quite open to most anything, um, whether that be completely different tools or completely different even small business management help, helping or like anything along those lines of of social media or beyond, um, we're very open to. So if there's any thoughts from you all, if we can move in a certain direction, we'd be very excited to hear from you. I think in terms of what we're currently working on, it's maybe not anything super far afield from uh, social media at the moment, um, but definitely open to, to any possibility there. Great. Um, Just seeing what other questions we have here in the list. This is one that came in from Google Plus from Roman. And the question here is, out of all the businesses and practices mentioned in reinventing organizations, uh, which do you see Buffer being the most similar to in the way that we approach teal organizational structure? Um, yeah, that's that's a great one. And I, I'm excited to kind of see that, that you've gotten quite familiar with that book too, Roman. It's, it's a great one for us. Reinventing Organizations is the name of the book. And it's it offers this idea of kind of a new way that businesses might be moving toward in terms of organizing themselves. Um, the move is a bit towards self-management and wholeness, where you bring your whole self to work. Um, there's no like, you're your work self when you're at work, you're your, your other self when you're at home. Um, then the third part is evolutionary purpose, where the, the company will move in the way that it's um, intended and meant to move. And among those kind of three things, we're, we're doing our best to kind of learn about those and adopt them. And uh, we've taken a lot of inspiration. I think we've we've recently learned a lot from companies like Medium and, and Zappos and some others that have been kind of pioneers in a lot of ways um, towards self-management and um, this concept of holacracy and other things. So those ones, those ones resonate a lot with us currently. Um, I think in terms of the ones that were mentioned in, in reinventing organizations, um, I'm trying to think what the specific names were of some of them. <clears throat> I think one of them was was the one that did uh, the machine parts. I think it was Favi, and there's lots of cool things there. I think in reading through the, the reinventing organizations book, a lot of it was industries that aren't quite startups like we are. So we're kind of excited for the chance to explore this as a startup. And Favi or, or Favi, I think it's F A V I. Um, are kind of similar in that they are a very unique industry. Also, they they create parts for cars and have a sales side and all this stuff. And that they have found a way to work within the the bounds of kind of wholeness and self management and and purpose um, and made it work for them is really encouraging and uh, and inspiring for us to kind of follow in those footsteps. So I don't know if we feel like most similar to them, but I personally feel like they've done such great work in pioneering that from um, being such an individual type of of industry. That, uh, that we can probably learn a lot from them and their example. Great. And I'm going to grab one more before time runs out here. And then um, any that I didn't get to, I'd love to kind of uh, to focus on replying to the comments or sending out some messages to make sure answers get out to everyone. Uh, this is one from Julie, and she sent this one in over email. And the question is, what is the ideal number of calls to action in a marketing email? And I, it feels funny to say this, but I think I think the answer is one. Um, I, and if I remember kind of more of Julie's context to the question, it was this idea of having multiple events or multiple things happening where you want to kind of get the word out about lots of different things. And from my experience, having one call to action is typically best um, in that it kind of really focuses both the content of the email and then focuses the action of the person that you're, you're emailing. So the conversion rate tends to be a bit better the fewer calls to action that you have because there's your attention and your actions are less divided among lots of different places. If you do have a case where you need to have multiple things to share or to say, um, then maybe more of like a newsletter approach is best where the expectation is set that there's going to be multiple things here and click on the one that's most most interesting to you versus kind of a launch or announcement email where you have lots of things you want to say. But I think it's in those times, it's best to kind of focus on just the one thing, um, the biggest action that you can take or the biggest 
the biggest place you can send someone to, whether that's a landing page where the rest of your stuff is detailed out, um, or if it's just focusing on one specific thing um, to kind of get to and, and to, to convert with. So thank you, Julie, for that, that great one. That's awesome. Well, wonderful. This has been so great to spend a bit of time with you. Thank you for letting me talk so long and <laughs> maybe ramble a little bit on some answers. Um, I really appreciate all the great questions that have come in and the chance to kind of connect with you all in this in this new live Q&A way. We'd love any feedback on how this has felt for you and how it has gone. You can continue to use the hashtag Buffer Live on Twitter and Google Plus and anywhere else. Uh, leave any comments here on our event page or any of our social channels, and we'll be really happy to jump on those and to help get you all some answers. Um, yeah, I guess thank you so much for attending and for spending some of your day with us. And we're looking forward to trying some more fun things and doing more things with you all. And until next time, I'll talk to you soon.